Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Alison Suen. She is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Iona College, New York. She is the volume editor of Response Ethics, the author of Speaking, The Speaking Animal, Ethics, Language and the Human-Animal Divide, and the book we're going to talk about today, Why It's Okay to Be a Slacker. So, Dr. Sue, and welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me here. Um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me first ask you, how do you define a slacker exactly? Okay, so um, I think there are, there are three components uh, to, to, to slacker. Uh, the, the first is that a slacker is someone who fails to achieve their potential, who doesn't live up to what is expected of them. And the second component is that the slacker's underachievement has to do with a lack of effort. In other words, uh, the unwillingness to put in the work has to be the cause of their underachievement. Uh, because you can be an underachiever not because of a lack of effort, but because of a lack of opportunity, for example. Right. So someone who has a great academic potential may have to quit school and work uh, to support the family. And in that case, uh, they, they are not uh, achieving what is expected of them, but we wouldn't call them a slacker. So for an underachiever to be a slacker, uh, the cause of their underachievement has to be the lack of effort. And the third component uh, of, of a slacker is, uh, is the attitude. So a slacker does not care. More specifically, a slacker does not care to achieve the potential or make themselves useful, right? It is this apathy or indifference uh, towards fulfilling expectations or self-improvement that really defines a slack. So that's mm. how I understand that. Right, and we will probably come back to this question later on when we talk about the morality of slacking. But, I, I mean, the slacking, for it to be real slacking, does it have to be unproductive or can it be slacking that then later on leads to productive results? Ah, okay. Um, yeah, so, so that's a very good question uh, because we tend to think of slacker as someone who is lazy and unproductive. But, and a lot of slackers are, but I don't think that productivity or the lack of productivity is necessarily a good measure for slacking. And the reason is that a slacker doesn't have to be someone who is lazy or irresponsible. A slacker is not necessarily someone who never works and just leech off of others, right? If a slacker is just someone who smoke pot in the basement all day, then we wouldn't, <clears throat> we wouldn't see a lot of them. And in, it, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to talk about uh, slackers in a workplace. But we do encounter slackers at work. We do encounter slackers in school. So I think it is a mistake to think of a slacker um, as someone who is completely unproductive. Um, in fact, they do need to be somewhat productive and responsible in order to slack in a sustainable way. Um, I can give you uh, an example of a slacker professor, right? If a slacker professor wants to keep the job, they do have to show up to the classroom to teach, okay? They do have to grade assignments and exam papers, right? Because if they don't, then they get complaints and probably get fired. So in order to be a sustainable slacker, uh, you, you need to do just enough, okay? I think that's the key. You need to do just enough to get by. You need to do just enough uh, so that you don't draw attention or scrutiny from your boss, right? So if you want to slack in peace, you do need to do some work. Right. And in the book, you talk about different kinds of slackers. So, for example, pseudo slackers, performative slackers, counterculture slackers. Uh, I mean, why do you distinguish between these different types? Yeah. Um, well, the reason is that uh, I think that... Um, uh, a lot of people think of themselves as slackers, but they are not really a full-fledged slacker the way I understand it. So, yeah, so as you're right. In my book, I talk about different types of slackers, uh, just as the one that you mentioned. Um, and, uh, but to my mind, many of these slackers, uh, 
as I said, they are not real slackers, right? So one type of uh, pseudo slackers, uh, for example, is what I call the self-flagellating uh, slacker. It is the kind of slacker who think that they are slacker and who constantly uh, chastise themselves for not working as hard as they should, but they are in fact uh, pretty productive. Um, and I think that uh, these self-flagellating slackers, a lot of time they just have a really distorted sense of productivity, right? And I see self-flagellating slackers a lot in, academ in academia, actually. Many of my colleagues in philosophy would uh, blame themselves for not writing and publishing more, even uh, colleagues who have a long, impressive uh, resume. Uh, in fact, a lot of times uh, when I talk to someone about my slacker book, they would immediately tell me, oh, I'm a slacker, uh, you're writing about me, okay? Which to me is pretty fascinating because um, uh, uh, the fact that you know, so many people in my profession think of themselves as a slacker, despite being hyper productive by conventional standards. Um, so I would say pseudo slackers, uh, such as uh, self flagellating slackers are not real slackers. Um, I mean, they think they are, uh, they think they are, but I think if we include these slackers, we would really be stretching the meaning of slacking a little too far. Um, so performative slackers are not delusional like the sl uh, self-flagellating slackers. Uh, I think it's true that a lot of times these uh, performative slackers work very little, um, but they use slacking as a way to show off. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, one kind of uh, performative slackers is what I call a disingenuous slacker. And uh, these slackers is the, uh, is the really lucky slacker who somehow managed you know, to get an A in an exam without putting in a lot of efforts, right? Um, and a disingenuous slacker tends to play up their slacking by saying something like, oh man, I didn't study for the exam, right? But what they are really trying to say is that well, I don't have to study in order to get an A. Um, so finally, the, uh, the counterculture slackers. These are slackers, uh, and, and I think we will say more about that. Uh, these are the, the kind of slackers who use slacking as a form of protest, okay? They reject the social expectation to be productive, to make something of themselves, Right. Um, so slacking for them is a way to withdraw or at least to distance themselves from the kind of hyperproductive culture that they find suffocating. They are like they're kind of like vegans who reject, you know, meat and animal products as a way to uh, distance themselves from factory farming. So uh, uh, counterculture slackers do slack for a purpose. Right. And in the book, you also talk about different kinds of slacking, like, for example, leisure, loafing, idleness, not working. So could you tell us about these different kinds and why you distinguish between them? OK, well, so in my book, I use uh, leisure as an umbrella term uh, for a variety of anti-work positions. And I think slacking is actually unique and it is different from all these other types of uh, anti-works attitudes that you see in the leisure literature in that slacking is decidedly purposeless, okay? So actually philosophers have, uh, uh, they have promoted leisure for a really long time and we can trace that all the way back to Aristotle. Uh, for him, we work in order to have leisure so leisure is the end that we are trying to obtain. But uh, for Aristotle and, and other philosophers, uh, leisure is not the same as doing nothing. It is actually quite the opposite. Um, uh, for him, leisure means having the kind of intellectual pursuit that has very little to do with practical uh, necessities. So in other words, I think, the, I think the distinction is something like this. On the one hand, there's work, right? Which is basically anything that you do to cover your basic necessities. Um, for example, I go to work to pay rent and put foods on my table. And then on the other hand, uh, there's leisure, which is basically things that we pursue for its own sake. For example, uh, reading Pride and Prejudice, right? So unless you, you study Jane Austen for a living, Reading Pride and Prejudice is probably not something that you do for practical purposes. Um, so so I, I think to, 
one thing to keep in mind is that even though leisure is not done for practical purposes, it is still purposeful. And it is this is why I think slacking is completely different from leisure. Okay. And um, uh, in fact, you know, for uh, for many of these pro leisure philosophers, we need leisure in order to actualize our humanity. We need uh, leisure in order to advance civilization. And if we don't have any leisurely non practical pursuits, then we are not really living the kind of life that is worthy of who we are as humans. Um, so it is actually intimately tied to our humanity. Right. And are slackers well portrayed in art? I mean, is the idea that people have about slackers, uh, I, I mean, is it right? Or mm -hmm. particularly when it's portrayed in art, do people do a good job of it? Uh, yeah, so I think that, uh, well, so in my book, I have a, I have a chapter on the Hollywood uh, slackers. Uh, uh, I watch a lot of slackers movie for this book, uh, which is why it was really fun to write. Um, and uh, I, I, well, I, I, I don't know. I guess uh, some of them, uh, I don't know if I would necessarily call them artwork, uh, but, uh, you know, they are creative, you know, uh, 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 avenues to, to, to portray, you know, slacking. And I think a lot of uh, the, the cultural um, images that we get from slacking comes from these Hollywood uh, movies. Um, so, so, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, so I think that Hollywood slackers, I mean, they, they, I think the Hollywood movie, uh, you know, do a good job in portraying, portraying slackers in so far as we actually get a lot of uh, our idea of what slackers are from these movies. Right. Mm -hmm. And since you're an academic, is there anything special about academic slackers? I mean, do they tend to fall under any of these different slacking categories we've been talking about or they have for example, some unique characteristics? Yeah, I think there's something, uh, there's definitely something special about a Slacker student because in a way, I think Slacker students uh, give us a really intuitive uh, uh, way to see that a Slacker is not necessarily someone who doesn't do the job, right? Or someone who is freeloading. Uh, because when you think about it, a Slacker student isn't someone who get paid in exchange for their labor, right? And uh, this is true even with a scholarship student, because even though they, they get money, they are not being paid for their labor. Uh, so we would have to ask, well, in what sense can a student be a slacker? And I think one way to understand this is to go back to the definition uh, of slackers that I talked about earlier, which is, some, which is someone who, uh, a slacker is someone who fails to achieve their potential because of the lack of effort. A student can be a slacker uh, because the way we measure their success is not by their productivity, but by something that, but by whether they live up to their promise, okay? So for example, we don't call every student who failed exam a slacker. Only those who didn't, you know, uh, uh, try are considered slackers, right? So. What we measure when it comes to students is not the output or productivity um, uh, in and of itself, but you know the efforts that they put in, and uh, and we judge their accomplishment relative to their potential. So I think the best way to describe a slacker student is is something like this: a slacker student is someone uh, who only wants to do the bare minimum to get by. Um, and they will study just enough to get a passing grade or whatever the lowest grade that they, 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 they believe would satisfy their parents, for example. So, so this is why I think that a slacker student uh, gives us a, um, the most intuitive way to see that slacking is not about um, not doing the work that you are paid to do, but about failing to achieve your potential or the expectations that other people have uh, for you. Right. Uh, do you think that slacking is something that only works for people with certain personality traits, like, for example, the ones who have low conscientiousness? I mean, because mm -hmm. I would imagine that people who have high conscientiousness would feel a lot of guilt or something like that. Yeah, 
I think it is fair to say that a lot of uh, a lot of slackers not very conscientious. Uh, but at the same time, I also want to uh, push back a little bit. Uh, okay. I think the the lack of uh, conscientiousness is a common but not a necessary uh, feature of of slacking. Um, I do think that slackers tend not tend to not care so much about how they are perceived, and. It is not necessarily that they have a high confidence or healthy self-esteem. It could just be that they are kind of oblivious or insensitive to, to the social expectations to, uh, to be productive. And I, think, uh, and I think this is why sometimes people even look at slackers almost with a kind of admiration, right? Because I think everyone wants to be able to say, well, I don't care what other people think of me or that, oh, I'm just doing my own thing, I don't care. So there's something attractive about uh, not caring. Um, but uh, uh, I also don't want to romanticize it too much because uh, I, I think that not caring is mostly unintentional because you can't really talk yourself into not caring. Uh, I mean, it certainly is possible to work less, but not caring is an attitude that, uh, but not caring is not an attitude that you can just change, like flipping a switch. Uh, so, um, so yeah, so, so I think, yeah, so to, to answer your question, I think uh, a lot of slackers are not very conscientious, but I think this is just a common quality, not a necessary uh, co quality of slacking. Mm -hmm. Do you think that nowadays we tend to live in hyper-productive societies and perhaps uh, thinking and talking about slacking would help us put that into perspective and perhaps deal a little bit better with the ways we feel about being productive. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that we live in a hyper productive uh, society um, to the point where even leisure or rest is often appropriated by the productivity narratives. Uh, because it is not uncommon to hear people saying that, well, we need to rest in order to increase productivity. Uh, in fact, a lot of companies, they install uh, what they call sleep pods in the workplace uh, for yeah. workers to take a nap midday, right? Uh, and the rationale, of course, is that uh, taking a break can make us work better and harder. Uh, and um, uh, so I think for me, the, the problem it, it's not even about feeling exhausted uh, from the endless uh, work or you know constant competition. Uh, to me, the the problem of you know this hyper productive culture has to do with the way our identity is so tied to our productivity. Uh, the idea that uh, who we are is determined by the things that we do or produce, and uh, and this is a problem because. I think it creates a kind of identity crisis when we, for example, for whatever reasons, uh, lose our job or the ability to be productive. Mm -hmm. By the way, since you mentioned that the sort of correspondence we establish between what we are and what we do, uh, do you think that there would be any healthy ways of going around that and perhaps establishing other sorts of identities that wouldn't gravitate around what we do? Yeah, uh, so I don't know if it is necessarily healthier, but I, I think there are alternatives. Uh, hmm. So, for example, I think relationship is a pretty common way uh, of, of how we understand our identity. We often hear people say, for example, uh, I'm a father, you know, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, husband, wife, and so on. Uh, so it is not uncommon for people to think of who they are in terms of how they relate to other people, especially uh, if that relationship is significant uh, to them. And uh, I, uh, but I also don't want to say that it is necessarily healthier, especially mm -hmm. if you are in an abusive relationship, right? Then uh, uh, it could be significant, but not necessarily good for you to tie who to tie your identity to to an abusive relationship. Um, so someone can also identify themselves uh, in terms of their beliefs. So for example, they might say, I'm a Christian, I'm an atheist, I'm a conservative, I'm a progressive. They may say something like that. 
or other people can even identify them themselves with their traumatic experience. So for example, they might call themselves, I'm a survivor, a survivor of abuse. Uh, so I think that uh, despite our productivity culture, there are ways to understand who we are other than what we do. Uh, but I wouldn't necessarily call these ways better ways. I think, <laughs> I think we need a more balanced way to think about who we are, not just from what we do, but also from, you know, our relationship, but not just our relationship, but maybe also our belief, our experience, you know, so I think it, it should be a balance of different things. Right. So now talking about m the morality aspects of slacking, mm -hmm. are slackers freeloaders? And if so, in what ways can they be freeloaders? I think a lot of uh, uh, slackers are, are freeloaders. Um, uh, uh, but I do, once again, I think the I think what I would say is that uh, freeloading is a is a common but not a necessary quality of of, of slacking, um, and uh, and and even with a freeloading uh, slacker, um, I think a lots of times when we are upset with the freeloading type of slackers, what we are really upset about is their sense of entitlement and not really the slacking. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of uh, entitled freeloader slackers out there, but that doesn't mean that um, uh, entitlement or freeloading uh, is a necessary feature of, of slacking. Uh, so uh, there are also, you know, a lot of slacker who who like to smoke pots, but that doesn't mean that smoking pots is a necessary uh, condition for for slacking. Uh, so I think it is important, you know. Uh, so even though you know freeloading is a very common feature, I I, I think it is important to um, to separate the common feature and the essential features. Right, mm -hmm. is slacking morally wrong? Uh, the short answer is no, <laughs> but the uh, but the the longer answer is uh, depends. It depends on you know what kind of. Um, uh, uh, what kind of charge that is uh, being made against the uh, against the slacker, right? So, for example, uh, if if uh, suppose you accuse a slacker for uh, uh, for freeloading, say someone in the team project who never does anything but still claim credits that they don't deserve. Uh, so, I think they're certainly irritating. But uh, what, as I said, right, what what really bothers us is their sense of entitlement. Rather than the fact that they they that we have to do their share of work, or suppose you accuse a slacker for causing emotional distress to people who care about them. Uh, think about the slacker's parents, for example. Uh, surely the slacker is doing some kind of harm by causing them distress. Now I I do think that we can be blamed for causing other people emotional distress. But it also depends on the context because uh, people get offended or distressed for all sorts of reasons, right? And parents, uh, especially, they get distressed for lots of reasons, right? Uh, my mom was very distressed when I tried to learn how to drive, for example. And uh, my, my friend's parents get upset if my friend, you know, doesn't call home every day. So I would say that causing emotional distress in and of itself isn't morally bad. Uh, so, so I think that uh, even if we assume that a slacker uh, is causing someone emotional distress, we still have to see uh, whether, whether you know, I don't think we can immediately blame the slacker for that. Or suppose you you accuse a slacker for being selfish, right? Uh, because if you ask a slacker, uh, well, what if you know, uh, would you want to live in a world in which everyone is a slacker? And the slacker will probably tell you, no, I don't want to live in a slacker world, right? Because even though I'm a slacker, I still want to live in a world that is fun and interesting. And uh, and so other people will have to do, we have to work hard to make this uh, world fun and interesting for me. Um, so now, so maybe we can accuse the slacker for being selfish. But then again, it is not necessarily unreasonable for us to rely on others in this way, right? In, imagine someone asked me. Well, would you like to live in a world in which 
uh, there are no leaders, okay? I may say, no, I think leadership is a good thing, right? I would really want someone to take up the responsibility to lead, even though I myself would never want to run for office. Okay. Or suppose someone asks me, would you like to live in a world with, uh, without any children, right? I might say, no, I love children. I think they are delightful. But I also don't want the commitment. I just want to play with them every now and then. So I would just rather have other people to take up the responsibility of parenting. So my point is that uh, it may seem selfish for a slacker to slack, while at the same time uh, um, wanting others to be productive. But I, I also think that this sort of asymmetry is actually not that unusual or even unfair when you think about how it might apply in other contexts as well. Mm -hmm. But when we are analyzing slacking from an ethical point of, point of view, do you think we should do it from a deontological, a consequential or a virtue, virtue ethical perspective? Yeah. Yeah, so my defense of slacker is not actually guided by any of these three major okay. uh, ethical frameworks. I just okay. can't look at what people say typically uh, when they criticize slackers uh, for not doing the best. Uh, like I look at how, you know, slackers allegedly wrong other people or even themselves for not making an effort. So the kind of harm that we are talking about, uh, so I, I look at, you know, what kind of harm are we really talking about here? So that's how I approach, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the, the critique there. But when I read your question, uh, I realized that I, I talked about Kant and Aristotle in my book, but I haven't yeah. actually looked at it uh, from a really consequentialist or utilitarian uh, perspective. And, and I imagine that utilitarian would probably be against slacking uh, because a slacker is someone who could have created a lot more utility, but they don't care enough to make that happen, right? So let's say there's a very you know, talented chemist who could have created a life-saving drug, but instead of working diligently at the lab, they work just enough to not get fired, right? So I guess a utilitarian would say that, well, I, I guess a utilitarian would be against slack, slackers for that reason, that they fail to maximize utility. Right. And, and uh, I mean, what would you say are the best arguments against slacking? Yeah, um, I thought that, uh, I actually thought that, uh, you know, Kant's argument that we owed it to ourselves to self-improve is, is probably the best argument. Well, at least I, I, I found his argument a more interesting one. Um, and, and the reason is that uh, Kant doesn't really condemn slackers as uh, parasitic, right? His, his beef with slackers is that they are not living the kind of life worthy of who they are. So uh, the slacker has wronged themselves by leading a life unworthy of the kind of creatures that they are. Um, and another way to put it is that uh, the slacker is not living up to the humanity for Kant. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty, you know, pretty interesting argument that, that I, I, I mean, I, I actually devote a whole chapter on, on Kant, uh, I think for that reason. <laughs> Yeah. Do you think that when people attack slackers, that they usually attack something that is really characteristic of slackers, or are they mostly attacking caricatures or straw men of slackers? Mm. Yeah, so, so going back to what I said earlier, I think a lot of times when we are, so let's take the freeloader slacker, right, uh, once again, um, when we are upset with them, what we are really upset with is their sense of entitlement, not necessarily the fact that they are slacking. So I think it, it, it is true that a lot of times, you know, uh, we are not even correctly identifying uh, what really is bothersome uh, to us. But I don't think the, uh, I mean, the straw manning is not, is not, mm, it's not intentional. But I, because I do think that uh, there are enough freeloading slacker out there to give us the impression that, you know, this is what slackers are. Right. And when can we say slacking is too much or already a problem? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know if uh, uh, an individual can slack too much, especially if we define a slacker 
as someone who doesn't care about achieving their potential. But I guess maybe we can talk about the degrees of indifference or, or apathy. Uh, maybe some slackers uh, know that they are supposed to care, but they just don't. And maybe other slackers are so oblivious that they don't even know that they are supposed to care. Uh, but I guess when it comes to not caring, it, it doesn't really matter whether you are only somewhat indifference or extremely indifference because uh, it seems to me that as long as this apathy or indifference lead to a failure to achieve your potential uh, I guess the end result is probably pretty similar mm -hmm. do you think that people in general should slack more or that it they could slack more without it being a problem uh, <laughs> I, I think people can certainly work less. Uh, okay. But, uh, I, I'm not advocating for slacking in my book. Uh, I'm, only, I'm only defending it as something that is uh, morally uh, permissible. Um, but I do think that the, the hyperproductive culture that we have right now is actually producing you know, sensory overload. Uh, we have new books, new games, and new sorry, technology <laughs> coming out of... Uh, coming out at a pace a lot faster than, than we can consume and digest, and it can be really tiring. So it, I, I don't think it hurts for us, to everyone to just slow down a little bit. Uh, maybe we just don't need to push ourselves to our limits all the time. Yeah. Do you think that slackers should care about, uh, them, about their own image if they are viewed as slackers by other people? I mean, would the social consequences that derive from it be a problem that slackers should care about? Yeah, yeah, that, that's really interesting. Um, I don't know if they should care more or not, but I think that a, a, a true or full-fledged slacker probably doesn't care all that much about how they are being, uh, the fact that they're being perceived as, as a slacker. Um, and I think that if being a slacker, being perceived as a slacker bothers you, then you are probably not a full-fledged uh, slacker. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I, I don't know if they should care more or not. Uh, I don't think it is, I mean, I guess in general, I would say that uh, maybe we should care less about what other people think of us. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Do you think that slacking is a necessary component of human flourishing? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, I think we need to figure out what uh, human flourishing means. And, sure. and, and the term that we typically see in virtue ethics, right? Uh, so the, so for, for the virtue ethicists such as uh, Aristotle, human flourishing means uh, exercising the function that is specific to humans and achieving the goal that is proper to who we are as humans. Um, so for Aristotle, rationality is the function specific to humans. So for him, flourishing means exercising our rationality or living a rational life. Um, so now I think we may disagree with Aristotle on what flourishing means, but I think he is quite right to think that flourishing has something to do with our capacities. Uh, we can imagine a life where we eat and drink and sleep and have sex all day. Um, now, it, it may be a very pleasurable life, but um, I think lots of people wouldn't think of that as a life that is particularly fulfilling for a human, right? And I think it is precisely because a human can do a lot more than just you know, eating and, and drinking and having sex all day. So even if you don't think of uh, uh, flourishing, flourishing as a, in terms of, you know, rationality, I think it is still plausible to say that human flourishing has something to do with achieving uh, some kind of goals that, that tie, you know, to our unique capacities. Now, I think that uh, given this particular understanding of human flourishing, uh, we can say that leisure is, is necessary for human flourishing. Whatever goals that we want to achieve, I think we do need to rest and take breaks, right? But then again, slacking, I, I want to say, is not the same as uh, leisure. A slacker just doesn't care to make an effort, and they certainly don't care about achieving their potential. So 
in a way, I would say that slacking is actually at odds with the kind of human flourishing that that is endorsed by Aristotle. Mm -hmm. Do you think that historical figures that we admire now would be less worried than we are about slacking? Mm. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, I can't really think of a historical slacker whom we admire, just top of my head. I think that there are certainly historical figures who were procrastinators. Uh, mm. But the procrastinator can still be po uh, prolific and productive, right? And given that we typically admire someone for their achievements, I think that, uh, uh, the, that I think that the slackers tend not to draw a lot of attention because they just don't produce that much or enough for us to remember them. Right. But by the way, since you mentioned procrastination, mm -hmm. does it have anything to do with slacking or is it a completely different thing? Yeah, I think they... I think the two are quite different uh, because procrastinators are not, um, so if we think of a slacker as someone who really doesn't care about achieving their potential, I think that, um, uh, so that's different from a procrastinator because a procrastinator, a lot of times people procrastinate because as an emotional response to the task that they have. Um, uh, so. So for example, uh, if I'm very stressed out about a particular paper, right, I might push it off, push it off, um, but not because I don't care about it. In fact, I very much care about it, right? It's just that I, I, I want to delay working on it because uh, I don't want to have to deal with that uh, stressful, you know, uh, feeling uh, right now. So I, I do think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, procrastination is quite different uh, from slacking. Mm -hmm. In the book, you also talk a little bit about the COVID-19 pandemic. So yeah. why do you mention it and why do you think that perhaps it puts slacking into perspective? Yeah, uh, well, I actually wrote uh, the bulk of the book during the beginning of the lockdown. Um, yeah. and, and in fact, uh, without the pandemic, I'm not sure if I could finish the manuscript on time because... Uh, well, because of the lockdown, you know, there were not many distractions and I was able to focus. Um, and one thing that I noticed early on uh, during the lockdown is this tension between uh, productivity and slacking. Uh, so a lot of people, at least at the very beginning, were trying to find ways to be productive because they were stuck at home, right? So, of course, many people had to work at, uh, from home, so they, they kept themselves busy. But a lot of people lost their jobs, actually, and some folks had to stay home to quarantines. So a good number of people uh, 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 were trying to find ways to kill time. And um, in the U.S., a lot of people pick up baking uh, to the point where there was a shortage of flour in the supermarkets. Uh, I think I talk about it in the book. And people also, you know, even raise their own chickens, you know, or, or start, you know, writing or start their own businesses, right? So clearly a lot of people are trying to find ways to keep themselves busy, to maintain some kind of productivity. But the flip side of these go-getters is the pandemic slackers, right? If we, if we search online, um, we see a lot of recommendations for movies or TV shows that you can binge during the lockdown. And uh, right before the stay-at-home order uh, was taken into effect in California, People are lining up, you know, outside of these uh, marijuana dispensaries so they can stock up, you know, on flowers and edibles. So in addition to these uh, go-getters, the pandemic also produced, you know, slackers who used the lockdown as an opportunity to get high and watch TV all days, which is, you know, uh, the typical image of a, of a slacker. So I found this tension between our aspiration to be productive and our desire to slack uh, really fascinating. Um, another thing that I think I should mention about slackers and the pandemic is that the term slacker actually has a pretty interesting uh, history. So, so the word initially, um, it was initially a term referring to men who uh, evade their military duties during um, uh, the First World War in the U.S. So the draft evaders were called uh, slackers. And during the 1918 pandemic, this term is extended to people who didn't wear a mask. So they were called the uh, uh, 
uh, uh, the mask slackers, right? They are considered unpatriotic. Uh, like the draft evaders, right, the mask slackers uh, refuse to do their part uh, for their country. So there is a pretty interesting connection between, you know, uh, slacker and, and pandemic, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, since you mentioned the origin of the term, is it that philosophers have already been thinking about this sort of attitude, uh, of slacking attitude for a long time, or is it something more recent? I think that, uh, well, so philosophers, philosophers have been thinking about leisure for a really long time. Uh, um, uh, so, uh, for example, uh, uh, Aristotle, right, or Russell or, or Piper, they, they all talk about leisure as this foundations uh, for civilization or culture. Um, so, so I think that for a really long time, you know, philosophers have recognized that uh, intellectual pursuit actually has a lot to do with not doing the mundane work that that we do uh, every day. Um, but then I think recently, recently we have a more we have more books or more um, discussion on on not working as a response to the kind of hyper productive culture that that we have. So I think there's a resurgence of a uh, you know interest in 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 talking about you know not not doing so much work, but but then again, you know, I I, I don't think that uh, once again, you know, I I think even for the anti-work <laughs> uh, book, um, they are not really they're not really promoting the kind of you know not achieving your potential kind of you know slacking that I'm defending in the book. Right. Uh, does slacking connect in any way to a broader philosophy of life or worldview? Like, for example, could it be connected to nihilism? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a really good question. And I think they, they do share something in common in that I think both a nihilist and a, and a slacker live as if there's no purpose uh, to life. Uh, but I also want to emphasize that a slacker just slacks. Uh, it is not that they live their life according to some ideology. Uh, the fact that they live their life without a purpose is not because they have a belief that life has no uh, purpose. Um, so in my book, I also talk about uh, the dissident uh, slackers. Uh, those are, you know, individuals who use, they're, they're like, they are countercultural uh, slackers who who use slacking to protest our work culture, right? So the, for the dissident slackers, the slacking is actually motivated by a philosophy of life that rejects capitalism and productivity culture. But as I argue in my book, um, a dissident slacker is not a full-fledged slacker because they actually made slacking into something that is purposeful, uh, which is contrary to the spirit of slacking. So uh, just one last question and connected to this previous one. Do you think that slacking, even if uh, not consciously or unintentionally, that it could be it could be an attitude more in tune with the purposelessness of life? Yeah, yeah, I think the lack of purpose is actually the defining quality of, of slacking. So so yes, I, the 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 answer is yes because uh, this is this is basically the the spirit of slacking is to not really think of your life as having some kind of grand purpose or that, or, or that your life having some kind of uh, you know uh, telos that you are trying to to achieve yeah okay so uh, before we go would you like to leave any final message I, 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 I mean in terms of the message of the book what uh -huh. your basic what was basically your aim with this book yeah so that yeah I, I yeah that's a that's a, that's a really good question because uh, a, a slacker is not going to pick up my book because they are not going to be I mean they, they don't really find a need to defend themselves right they, I don't think they care enough to do that uh, so and and I also want to you know once again make it very clear that I'm not trying to promote uh, 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 slacking because I think the minute we try to promote slacking as something that is worthy 
uh, of us to pursue, we are turning slacking into something else. Okay, uh, we are becoming this uh, dissident, you know, slack uh, dissident slacker who are not really uh, who care a little bit too much. I think uh, so. This is why, you know, for for even the for a theoretical reason, I don't want to uh, promote uh, slacking. But I think that my book can be useful for uh, maybe parents of, of slackers. You know, uh, they might they might want to know. Well, is it really a problem that you know my my child is a slacker, right? So so maybe my book will give them some kind of relief. At least I hope. <laughs> okay, so the book is again why it's okay to be a slacker. Uh, would you like to mention where people can find your work on the internet? Yeah, I think the usual uh, the usual retailers. Uh, well, so you can buy it from the publisher Rutledge uh, directly or um, on Amazon. I'm not sure, you know, which local bookstores carry it uh, right now. So I think, but you can find it online uh, pretty easily. Okay, so Dr. Suen, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. So to keep the channel sustainable and to keep it running, I would like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page. You have all sorts of benefits there. And any amount, even just $1 would already be a great help. You also have links to PayPal in the description box. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Enrique Lania, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervois, Bo Wangard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Arthur Coe, Zoop, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, George Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Librand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roch, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmides, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Agdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardus France, and Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.